There are certain things that will never ever make sense to me. Why do we make job applicants write pointless ask as he cover letters when you get all the information you need in the resume? Why does anyone drink gin? It's disgusting. And why are nuclear weapons allowed to exist? The only rational explanation for this, from my perspective, is that most people don't understand who actually controls nuclear weapons, how lucky we are to have not already blown ourselves up, what the impact would be of even a small nuclear exchange, and what the actual purpose of nuclear weapons is. And if everyone did understand those things, I'm confident that we'd all agree to sit down and refuse to move until every single one of them was replaced with a giant bottle of gin, and wars would just be trying to force your enemy to drink gin until they surrendered. There are currently around 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world, and most of the time you hear about them, it's in the context of some evil foreign leader threatening to use them. Vladimir Putin once again raised the prospect of a nuclear strike. Kim Jong-un unleashing an ominous warning. The whole of the U.S. mainland is within our firing range. So one man has the power to kill millions of people. Pretty scary. But if Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un are the only people you're worried about, you're not nearly worried enough because there are way more people with the power to launch nuclear weapons than you realize. We normally think of the decision to use nuclear weapons as very dictatorial. Nine countries have nuclear weapons, there's nine big red buttons, and only the leaders of each of those countries are allowed to push the big red buttons. But in reality, there are most likely dozens, if not hundreds, of big red buttons. And that's because of something called pre-delegation. I know it sounds boring like some kind of Canadian parliamentary procedure, but in fact it's very exciting if you find the prospect of burning alive exciting. So, here's how it works. Say you're a general in charge of planning how to win a nuclear war and you've been brainwashed into thinking that that's a good idea or even possible. The first thing you want to do is attack your enemy's headquarters. It's called a decapitation attack. You kill the enemy's leaders so they can't retaliate. But everyone knows that this is the first move. So to protect themselves from a decapitation attack, leaders pre-delegate the authority to launch nuclear weapons down the chain of command in case they're killed in an attack. And we now know that in 1957, President Eisenhower signed a top secret order to pre-delegate his power to the military in case of his death. But then he realized the other side probably already figured out that he'd do that. So he suggested that the person he was delegating to should probably delegate his authority to the next in the chain of command in case he got killed. And we have to assume that this went on and on down the chain of command like a Russian doll of Russian roulette. And we also have to assume that every nuclear weapons state has the same setup, which means that the whole world is bristling not only with nuclear weapons, but also with lots and lots of people empowered to use them, which is scary on its own. But it's way scarier when you consider the second way we underestimate the threat of nuclear weapons. The most likely trigger for a nuclear war isn't a deliberate attack, it's an accident. There are a long list of close calls. The incredible book Command and Control goes into detail on the near misses that we know about, including the 1961 Goldsboro incident when a plane carrying 39 nuclear bombs crashed in North Carolina, releasing two, one of which came a single flipped switch from detonating. And there was the 1980 Damascus incident when a dropped socket led to a chain of events that nearly wiped Arkansas off the map. But there was a much more recent example that brought this danger into focus again, something that happened in 2018 and everyone almost immediately forgot about. There was panic in paradise today. An accidental alert went out across Hawaii urging people to take shelter due to an incoming ballistic missile. Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard quickly tweeted that it was a false alarm. The U.S. Pacific Command replied, thank you, ma'am. And Twitter user RisePDX replied, bunghole idiots. Naturally, everyone wanted to know how this happened, and the answer was pretty unanimous. Human error. 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 So it turns out a nuclear officer basically freaked out. He thought there was an attack and he panicked. The alert that sent a wave of fear across Hawaii was sent by an employee who thought the threat was real. He has performance issues and throughout the 10 years he has confused drills at at least two times. So they put someone in charge of nuclear attack drills who didn't understand the difference between drills and real life. They probably should have covered that in the job interview, although 
they might have mistakenly thought that job interview was an actual job and their job was to answer questions about themselves. Thankfully, they were only in charge of warning about nuclear missiles and not launching them, but it points to the core danger of nuclear weapons. Humans control them, and humans make mistakes. In fact, they make so many mistakes that the only reason we haven't all been wiped out by nuclear weapons already is basically just luck. And it's worth taking a second here to make clear that these things can definitely wipe us out, and it wouldn't take many. According to one study, even a small nuclear exchange would be enough to cause a nuclear winter, resulting in mass starvation that would kill billions of people. So if you truly want to convince someone you're willing to use nuclear weapons, you need to convince them you're suicidal. If Vladimir Putin wants his nuclear threats to be taken seriously, he should be posting videos of himself alone, smoking weed in an empty bathtub listening to the Smiths. In fact, you could argue that nuclear weapons are so dangerous that they're useless. Using them would literally be overkill. Even American General Colin Powell argued this. The one thing I convinced myself of after all these years of exposure to the use of nuclear weapons is that they were useless. But I actually don't buy that. Nuclear weapons are extremely useful for two things. Committing mass murder and threatening to commit mass murder to get what you want. They haven't been used in the first way since 1945, when two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. But they're used in the second way all the time. It's often called nuclear blackmail when a country other than America does it. He's used nuclear blackmail against us. What we saw with the Iranian regime is another example of nuclear blackmail. North Korea may try to get the upper hand through nuclear blackmail. But when America threatens to exterminate an entire country, it's called keeping all options on the table. When you talk about Iran and you talk about how you have diplomatic efforts, you also say all options are on the table. Does that include uh, the possibility of a nuclear strike? Is that something that your administration will plan for? Uh, all options are on the table. That was 2006, and since then, that phrase, all options are on the table, has been used by presidents, vice presidents, and secretaries of state to signal a willingness to use military force up to and including nuclear weapons. And I keep all options on the table to prevent a nuclear run. What's happening in Venezuela is a disgrace. All options are on the table. We are not taking any option off the table. We also wanted to make it clear that all options are on the table. They're just options. Maybe we'll have some export tariffs on grain, maybe an arms embargo, or maybe we'll pulverize every man, woman, and child into a red mist of blood and bone, potentially triggering a larger nuclear exchange that creates so many urban firestorms that the resulting smoke encircles the planet, blocking sunlight and resulting in mass starvation that kills every living being on Earth. Daniel Ellsberg, who was famous for leaking the Pentagon Papers, released a book in 2017 called The Doomsday Machine about his time as a nuclear war planner in the 1960s. He gave a really clarifying analogy to understand how nuclear weapons are used. They have used them in the precise way that a gun is used when it is pointed at someone in a confrontation, whether or not the trigger is pulled. To get one's way without pulling the trigger is a major purpose for owning the gun. Even if you don't fire a gun you robbed a store with, you've still used it. You can't say to the judge, Your Honor, I was simply keeping all options on the table. Robbing that 7-Eleven clerk of choices would have been the real crime. The threat is the point. It's why the U.S. is undertaking a $1.2 trillion nuclear modernization program over the next few decades. And it's why every president since Harry Truman has refused to make a formal no-first-use commitment, which means the U.S. reserves the right to vaporize any country and all of its citizens for any reason at any time, even if it's not attacked. As long as that scene is a legitimate right for any country to claim for itself, it will be an option on the table, a table that we're all being forced to sit at. If you want to learn more about this topic, I highly, highly recommend The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg, and Command and Control by Eric Schlosser is a really detailed and compelling look at the history of futile attempts to make nuclear weapons safe. And if you're in a really grim mood and want to permanently traumatize yourself, you can watch the 1984 British film Threads, which depicts the aftermath of a nuclear war. That a straightforward, factual depiction of what a nuclear exchange would actually look like is possibly the most disturbing thing ever put on film tells you all you need to know about the degenerate logic at the core of nuclear strategy.
Threads features what has to be the bleakest ending in film history and resulted in this legendary IMDb entry for a woman whose only film credit is in Threads as woman who urinates on herself, which really is the perfect epitaph for humanity if these bombs ever go off. If you like the video, please subscribe and sign up for notifications. I'll be releasing a new one every two weeks and I promise the next one will be much more upbeat. It's literally about kittens. Thanks for watching.